Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. He is risen, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. He's alive. Heaven's gates are open wide, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. Now in heaven glorified, he's alive. Welcome to this online service from Christchurch Forward. If this is the first time that you've tuned in, you're very welcome. You're joining hundreds of us from across Sheffield, South Yorkshire, and we're told all over the world. All the words that we will sing will come up on the screen, but if you'd prefer to follow along on a service order, you can download that from the web page. There's also a worksheet for younger viewers to be able to uh, download as well. Well, here we are, Easter Sunday. It's the most glorious day of any year, but not least of all this year, as the world is in the grip of a pandemic, as we face the worry of death, what better than to celebrate death defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ, risen on this day. We're going to celebrate by singing together and the band, Ben, Joe, Patch and Maisie, who all happen to live under the same roof, are going to lead us now.
Christ is risen from the dead. And it's because he lives that we can talk to him in prayer. And as you see, while we've been singing that song, my wife Caroline has joined me and she's going to lead us in prayer now. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful good news that Easter Sunday brings, that the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead and conquered death. Thank you that for all who believe, we can have the confidence of eternal life. Amidst the anxiety and uncertainty of life during the coronavirus pandemic, we pray that this Easter, many more would come to trust in you and know that peace and certainty for themselves. Continue to give us opportunities to speak of this hope to those who do not yet know you and are fearful for themselves, family and friends. Enable us to have sensitive and comforting words as well as showing love and concern in practical ways. Loving Lord, as we remember your death and resurrection, thank you that we know we can be forgiven. We're sorry for the times we've not lived as we should have. In this time of isolation, restrictions and anxiety, forgive us for being short-tempered, grumpy, inconsiderate and not putting you first. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, to give us strength to be patient, humble and kind in our thoughts and actions. Sovereign Lord, we pray for the full recovery of Boris Johnson and protection for other government ministers to enable them to keep making wise decisions in running the country and protecting our health. We pray for protection for all hospital staff and other care workers who are particularly vulnerable. Help Christians working in these areas to be ready to explain the hope they have in you, despite being fearful themselves. Thank you for the hard work of those in other essential services and the thousands of volunteers that have come forward to help the NHS and the evidence of so much kindness being shown by neighbours and communities. We praise you for these qualities being shown in people in these hard times. Merciful Lord, as we see the rest of the world also struggling in this pandemic, we cry out to you for mercy to bring it to an end. Comfort those who grieve and feel there is no hope. We bring before you those nations who have limited healthcare resources and where there is great poverty. May these governments act wisely and for the good of all. Gracious God, we pray for those in our own church family who are lonely, anxious, ill, or facing financial uncertainty, whether from the coronavirus or something else. Use us to meet each other's needs in practical ways and by encouraging, through, encouraging them through your word. May we all seek to bring you more glory this Easter as we reach out to others and as we learn to increasingly trust and depend on you. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, Caroline. It was a few years back that I was asked just before Easter to go into a school uh, of 500 girls and to do an Easter assembly. I was a bit nervous, but I went with just one thing. I was armed with a daffodil. And as I went into the assembly, I began to eat the daffodil, petal by petal. I'm not gonna do it for you now. And I did that because uh, I said to the girls, if you go home to your parents and say, the vicar came in today and he ate a daffodil in front of us, they might not believe you. But if you took your friends home with you, three or four of them, they might start to believe you. But just imagine if all 500 of them, all 500 of you went to one of your parents and said, the vicar ate a daffodil in front of us all, then I'm sure they'd believe it. Now, the same is true of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that 500, more than 500 people witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. If just one had seen it, we might doubt it. But some of those people, uh, when, they, when that was written, were still alive and you could have gone and asked them for yourself. There are lots and lots of witnesses for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to celebrate uh, that wonderful message of Jesus risen from the dead as we sing again and Ben and the band are going to lead us. So for this song, we're going to have some help from some other members of our household again. So thanks, um, Jim and Ted, for doing the actions. Let's sing. Two, three, four. 
your name on high. We thank you for our Savior Jesus who came from heaven to earth, who went to the cross to die for us, to pay for our sins. We thank you that he rose again in victory and we celebrate that victory today on Easter Sunday. And Lord, we praise you this morning. Amen. Just as we've been singing I just want to read some words that remind us again of that glorious gospel story, the glorious truth of our Savior Jesus who came from heaven to earth for us. So listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Consider Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a wonderful saviour we have. Let's sing of him now. Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus. One of the best ways we can do that is to look into the Bible and so we're now going to turn to have our Bible reading and today we're going to read from Acts chapter 2 and reading from verse 22 to 32. You might like to turn that up if you have a Bible and uh, I'm going to pray for us now that God would speak to us through his word the Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father thank you very much that we can turn our eyes upon Jesus and we pray as we look at your word, the Bible, this morning, that we would indeed understand more of who he is and the wonder of the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're reading from Acts chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 22. The Apostle Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath 
that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. The year is 1975. I'm in the second year of secondary school. Today we'd call it year eight. And there I am, along with the rest of the year, in a long queue waiting to have my BCG injection. The BCG was an inoculation against the disease tuberculosis, a disease that attacked the lungs. A disease that was once responsible for one in eight of all deaths in the UK. And a disease that is still having a devastating impact today. Last year, it killed 1.5 million people worldwide. Not that I knew any of those statistics as I lined up as a 12-year-old boy. So picture the scene. There we were the whole year, forming a queue along the school corridor waiting for the jab. Being at a W, Williams, I was almost at the end of the line. And so I saw another kid, uh, one kid after another, going through the door marked nurse's office. One of the first to go in that door was a lad called Nigel Adcock. Uh, I need to tell you, I've changed the names to protect the characters involved in this story. Anyway, Nigel Adcock was one of the toughest boys in the year. So when he came out of the nurse's office, I had the fright of my life. This tough lad, this hard man of a 12 year old, someone who frightened all the other boys in the year. Nigel Adcock, as he walked out of the nurse's office, looked as white as a sheet. He staggered along the corridor, passed all the other kids in the line, and then he started to run, making a beeline for the door to the playground where he promptly threw up. And I thought to myself, if Nigel Adcock can't get into the, the door Mark Nurse's office and come out again without that happening to him, there is no hope for me. If that's what it did to Nigel Adcock, I am going to die in there. So I got more and more nervous as one kid after another went through that door. So as I waited, I decided to fix my eyes on another boy halfway up the line, a lad called Peter Harris. I could see Peter very easily because he was the tallest boy in the year. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else, but he wasn't only tall, he was incredibly skinny. He was so skinny, we used to say of Peter Harris that when he had a shower in the morning, he had to run around to get wet. He was so skinny that we used to tell Peter to turn sideways, to poke his tongue out, and then we'd tell him that he looked like a zip. Kids can be so cruel. If you're watching this, Peter, I'm sorry. Anyway, I figured that if Peter Harris, skinny Peter Harris, could go through the door Mark Nurse's office and come out again alive, then even I could survive it too. Now look, far more seriously in these extraordinary days, many of us are perhaps more aware than ever before that we will all one day have to go through a door marked death. It's a door that even the toughest, most successful, most wealthy and most self-confident people have to go through. And the thought of going through that door and not coming out again is absolutely terrifying. The comedian and actor and film producer Woody Allen is well known for his quips about death. He famously said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And on another occasion, he joked, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. In a more serious moment, though, he said this. All men fear death is a natural fear that consumes us all. For many people, death is a terrifying thought. That's why most of us don't want to talk about it. Whether it's the thought of, of nothingness or the fact that we don't know what's happening, what's going to happen to us as we go through that door, hoping that it will be a good experience, but really not knowing. Death is a horrible prospect. And that's why this pandemic is such a dark cloud hanging over us. But that's also why Easter Sunday is, is such a brilliant day, because on Good Friday, one man went through the door marked death. And then on Easter Sunday, he emerged. He came out of that door alive and well. On Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ defeated death. That was the life changing message that Jesus first followers proclaimed to the world. And it's what Christians have been shouting about ever since. This morning, we have before us here in Acts chapter two, one of the first sermons ever preached by one of Jesus' first followers, a man called Peter. And what dominated this sermon was the amazing news that Jesus had risen from the grave and that he, Peter, and others had witnessed it. Look halfway through verse 31. Peter says, Jesus was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life 
and we are all witnesses of the fact. And look at the end of verse 24. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. Jesus went through the door marked death and came out again. And so in Christ, there is the hope of life beyond the grave and a glorious future beyond death. And that future is made certain not only because of Easter Sunday, but also because of Good Friday and everything that happened in Jesus' life right up to that first Easter weekend. Look back with me to verse 22. Peter was preaching this to a group of thousands of people. And he says, verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, signs and wonders, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Peter says, look at Jesus' life. He was shown to be the special one by the things he did. Throughout Jesus' life, he did the most remarkable miracles. He healed people. Blind people were given sight. Lame people were able to walk. Sick people were cured. He fed 5,000 people with just a little boy's packed lunch. He turned water into wine and he walked across the sea. And in the greatest miracle of the lot, he raised a dead man to life. A man had already been dead for four days. He brought him back to life. And these miracles were seen by many people. You see the end of verse 22, Peter says, as you yourselves know. Peter was preaching this sermon to more than 3,000 people. Thousands of people had seen Jesus perform these miracles. If we'd been born 2,000 years ago, and lived in Israel, we'd have been able to see these miracles ourselves with our own eyes. They weren't um, done in a corner or in a specially designed film studio with clever but deceptive camera angles. Just take the resurrection of a man called Lazarus as an example. He'd been in the grave for four days. His flesh was already beginning to rot. There was a, a terrible stench coming from the grave. Lazarus was well and truly dead and yet with a word of command, Jesus called him out of the grave and Lazarus came out. And people were there when it happened. They saw it. They saw Lazarus shuffle out of the tomb. And afterwards, they were able to talk to Lazarus. Jesus did miracles, mighty miracles, to prove that he was who he claimed to be. Now, people often ask me, how do you know that God exists? Here's the answer. We know God exists because he walked among us and proved that he was God throughout the, through the miracles that he did. He performed miracles that are out of this world to prove that he was from out of this world. But here's the shocking thing. Look at the end of verse 23. We put him to death by nailing him to the cross. It's the most astonishing thing. God walked among us, proved who he was, lived the most wonderful life, the most loving life. He stood up against injustice and corrupt leadership. He cared for the poor and marginalised. He gave women a voice and he gave men a mission. God came among us as a man and we killed him by nailing him to a cross. That's how humanity treats God. And that's how we all treat God to a greater or lesser extent. When it comes to it, we don't want God to be God in our lives. We certainly don't want him to tell us how to run our lives. We want to live our lives our own way. We want to be free from anyone telling us how to live. And that includes God. Not so long ago, I was chatting to a guy called Roger. Nice fella, decent, hard-working kind of fella. Roger said to me, the problem with Christianity is that it's so restricting, it cramps my style. You know, thou shalt not do this, that and the other. I don't want anyone telling me how to live my life, he said. What right does God have to tell me what I can and can't do? Strangely, because of the days we're living in, I reckon we understand the answer to that question better than we ever have. I mean, if I told you this time last year that we were going to be ruled by a government that insisted that we stayed at home, a government that only permitted us to leave our home to go to work if it was essential or to get medical assistance or to buy food, and that we could only go out for exercise once a day, and that all restaurants and bars would be closed by the government, and that they were slapping fines on people who didn't comply with their rules. If I'd have said that a year ago, you wouldn't have believed me. And if you did even think it was vaguely possible, you'd have imagined that we were going to be invaded by a totalitarian regime with an ideology closer to communism than the free market economy we're actually living in. But now that it's happening, most decent citizens are not only complying with the government's restrictions, but actually agreeing with them. Most of us understand that 
These rules are for our good and for the good of the many, the good of the most vulnerable. We get it. Believe me, God is no different. When he tells us how to live and when he tells us what we can and cannot do, he always does it for our good because he's a loving God, a good God. He's for us and he's for the most vulnerable and downtrodden in society. But we don't like it. Like those who ignore the government's social distancing measures, we think we know best or, or we just don't care what impact our actions might have on others. So when God turned up, we got rid of him because we want to live our lives our own way. And on that first Good Friday, the human race did what we all do to God, shut him up. But that's not the whole story of Good Friday. Listen to what else Peter says in verse 23. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. There are two sides to the story of Jesus' death on a cross. One side is that God came among us, walked planet Earth, proved his God by performing miracles, living the most beautiful life, and we exterminate him. <laughs> but the other side of the story is that this was all part of God's plan for Jesus to die on a cross. The cross was God's way of reconciling mankind to himself. Because we don't want God in our lives, we deserve his punishment. At best, we ignore him. At worst, we kill him. That makes us God's enemies. God gives us every good thing we enjoy and we don't want anything to do with him. He gives us friends and food and fun and, and all manner of fantastic experiences. He gives us life itself, but we want nothing to do with him. If we think about it, just at the most basic level of common decency, we all realise how appalling that is. Last Christmas, I was given some wonderful gifts, gifts that my family and friends had gone to great lengths to find, gifts that were just right for me, some that were not cheap. I don't need to tell you that if I took those gifts without even the slightest thank you, or worse, if I ignored the people who gave me those presents and wanted nothing to do with them for the rest of the year, well, you'd think I was a seriously selfish specimen of humanity. And you wouldn't be surprised if the givers of those gifts were really upset with me. Well, that's how we treat God all our lives. So is it any wonder that he's angry with us? And so to meet him when we die will not be a good moment. The way we've lived without God makes going through the door marked death even more terrifying than we could ever imagine. Meeting the almighty creator of the entire universe, having largely ignored him all our lives, is a fate worse than death. It really doesn't bear thinking about. Because God is a, a just God, he can't sweep our crime against divinity under the carpet. That would be wrong. Uh, we don't like it when the justice system is corrupt or when a jury is unable to convict a felon or when a mistake is made by the prosecution and someone who is irrefutably guilty gets off on a technicality or when a judge gets it all wrong by dishing out a lenient sentence. We don't like injustice. And so we don't like the thought of God not being just himself. People have often said to me, I won't follow a God who doesn't do anything about and then they cite an appalling atrocity that's happened recently. Well, look, the good news is that God will punish evil. That's why there is a place called hell. God would not be a loving God if he didn't punish evil. It would be wrong of God to let wrong go without being punished. The good news is that God does punish evil. But the bad news is that includes you and me. We have committed the greatest crime in the universe. We don't want anything to do with God. And when he came among us, we put him on a cross. But in his glorious love, God wants to restore our relationship with him. He wants to be our friend. And so in order to satisfy his right anger at our sin, he did the most remarkable thing imaginable. He took the punishment that you and I deserved on himself. Let me take you to a courtroom. There's the judge on the bench and there are you in the dock and the sentence is being passed. You're guilty. You've lived life without God. The punishment, life imprisonment and life means life, never to be released. And then imagine the judge stepping down off the bench and standing in your place in the dock. And the judge saying to you, you can go free because I'm gonna serve your sentence for you. And then the prison guards cuff his hands and they lead him off to serve a sentence of life imprisonment and you go free. 
adds a little picture of what Jesus did for us. His sentence was death on a cross. God couldn't just let us off, that wouldn't be just. But because he loves us, he died for us, took our place. That's why Good Friday is so good. And that's how it's possible to go through that door marked death with confidence. Not only because Jesus rose from the dead, showing us that there is a way through the door marked death, but because Jesus died for our sin, taking the punishment we deserve and dealing with the anger of God and so making us ready to meet God when we finally go through that door marked death. It is the best news we could ever hear. And if it all sounds too good to be true, listen to what Peter says in verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. Do you hear it? What we're talking about here is based on the evidence of eyewitnesses. People stood at the foot of the cross and saw Jesus executed. People carried him to the tomb and buried him. They knew he was dead. But then people saw him after he'd risen from the grave and not just one or two people. This is what one of Jesus' followers wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, writes the Apostle Paul. Now, did you hear that? Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. And when those words were written, the writer Paul said, most of those people are still alive. His point? You can go and talk to these people and they'll tell you what they saw. They saw the risen Jesus. That's why I ate a daffodil in front of 500 schoolgirls. I wanted them to see that because 500 of them witnessed it, it was irrefutable. Even when people doubted, the number of eyewitnesses involved would have made the case. There is good solid evidence for the resurrection. Oh, I don't have time to go through it with you now. But look, if this is true, if Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he said he was. His death on the cross achieved what he said it did. And gloriously, death has been defeated. Someone has gone through the door marked death and come out of the other side. And so if we connect ourselves to Jesus Christ, we too can face death and God with confidence and look forward to a wonderful future beyond the grave. A future that is described in verse 28 as joy in God's presence. That's why Easter is the best news you can ever hear. And not least of all, as we are confronted by death through this terrible pandemic. Well, now let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for the glorious good news of Easter. Thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you that eyewitnesses saw it to record it, that we can know it's true. Thank you that death has been defeated. And thank you that as we repent and believe and trust in Jesus Christ, we too can be sure of life beyond the grave, with you forever, and enjoying you in a place of joy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, in celebration, we're now going to sing, Thine be the glory. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. 
Jesus meets us, risen from the tomb. Lovingly he greets us, scatters spirit and blue. Let the church with gladness, hymns of triumph sing. Conquering Son, it's glorious news. Well, thanks very much indeed for tuning in and joining us this Sunday. We'll be doing it all again next Sunday and we'd love you to join us once more. If anything has struck you this week and you want to follow it up, then there are two ways you can do that. We're going to start running from this Thursday, the 16th of April, a course called Christianity Explored. It's going to be via Zoom. And if you'd like to join us to investigate the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death and his resurrection, and find out more about what that means for you, then you can find out how to sign up for that course via the web page. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow up any more of what we've been thinking about, you can also download the discussion questions that are on the web page as well. Well, thanks very much. As we close, let me pray for us now. Let us pray. Now the Saviour who died who rose and who reigns. Give us peace in our troubles, hope in despair, and faithfulness in our struggles. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.